Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA. Uh, I've been looking forward to this segment. It's um, one of the debates we've had in this country is how do we treat people who... Um, terrorists, for example, after 9-11, we talked about enhanced interrogation techniques, torture, uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, we still have that debate to some degree today about who we want to be as a nation and what is the right way to do it. We've got two great guests this morning. Uh, Michael Kearns is a retired Air Force intelligence officer and former master survival evasion resistance escape instructor. It's called SEER, S-E-R-E. Uh, he used enhanced interrogation techniques uh, against hundreds of American troops in order to teach them how to safely survive brutal enemy interrogations until they are rescued or escape. A few years ago after 9-11, uh, Kearns learned that two SEER psychologists he'd worked with had reverse engineered the program and sold it to the Bush administration as a blueprint for the enhanced interrogation techniques employed at Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib, and other black sites around the world. When Kearns learned that they had made $80 million through its use, he went ballistic. Kearns blew the whistle to major newspapers, legislators, uh, online sites, government agencies, anyone with an ear, and no one listened. And refusing to be silenced, he ultimately turned to a television executive producer named Ronald Solomon, uh, who is a head writer and show creator, and he asked Solomon to co-write a book with him in which they would share his story. And the name of the book, it's a piece of fiction, but it uses as much factual information as possible and indicts those they believe to be guilty in a parallel narrative. It's called Broken. With us this morning, Michael Kearns and uh, Ronald Solomon here on the Gary Sutton Show. Michael and Ronald, great to have you on the show. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, great to be with you, Gary. Hey. Michael, uh, I want to talk to you first of all. You're a guy that, that trained people uh, in actually tortured them, I guess, and, and the enhanced interrogation techniques so they would be ready in case they were captured by the enemy, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, sure. It's a basic psychological uh, construct. Uh, it's one that actually was borrowed by the communist Chinese, the, the Soviet Union. Uh, we were protecting our own forces uh, that were on strategic reconnaissance operations, flying aircraft very close to uh, these nations. We had cryptologic linguists with lots of information. We wanted to make sure that they could uh, survive with their honor and come home, which typically through history, the communists in this case, if you are seen to have information, you tend to stay longer as their guest. Uh, whereas if you uh, don't say things, we call it staying in a circle, you know, a circle where your, your crew and yourself right. have a story that you worked on that it makes sense for what your aircraft is that you can be returned to your home uh, and with your honor intact. That was our goal. Tell me about the kinds of things that you would do to those soldiers uh, in terms of enhanced interrogation techniques, because there are people who say, well, they're torture, they're not torture. What were the things, you know, for example, most of us heard, have heard, of, the one thing we've heard a lot about was waterboarding. Did you, would you waterboard uh, men like this or, and women like this? Uh, our specific office, the Special Survival Training Program, did not do the water board mm -hmm. uh, as a physical entity. We used water, and you know, we put people in certain positions and have a cup of water, just sometimes just to shock them into reality of trying to give the correct answer. Uh, the Navy, in their basic combat survival school at North Island in California, that's the only place that I knew of that had a water board, a formal water board. You're strapped down to it, you get laid back, and the uh, water keeps coming until you choose to give up. What are, you know, you're, you're a guy that I, I know your position now is that, uh, you know, the, at least some of these enhanced interrogation techniques really are torture. Tell us how you came around to that after being a guy who, you know, was, was showing people how to do this and, and what really set you off. I read it a moment ago, but I think coming from you, it's going to mean a lot more. Sure. Uh, well, what's interesting is all we knew in the military for ages and ages, especially after the Korean War uh, and then getting into the Cold War, that these communist techniques were really quite uh, good at what they did in the sense of breaking a person down to a point where they'll say anything to have whatever is being done to them stop. So that would, to me, in the legal sense, that would be torture, doing something to a person uh, that then they uh, can't have stop. And certainly you take any of the EITs that were listed by the Bush-Cheney administration, uh, a hand slap, 
I would suspect that if it's done properly within the SEER school standards, your hand is only supposed to go from the shoulder of the person you're slapping to their face. So you're not really hitting the person. So all of the different techniques that we used in SEER school were modified so as it hurt, but it was not meant in a very, very uh, disastrous kind of slap, you know, one that would keep going on and keep going on. And that's what I read about in the recent global war on terror. Uh, interrogators are doing very, very harsh techniques on people that they don't even know if they have information or not. You are a master survival evasion resistance escape instructor. There's a lot to carry around with you right there. S-E-R-E. Um, you got into a situation after 9-11 uh, where you learned that two psychologists in the same program you're in there had worked with and had reverse engineered the program. How did that happen? What did they do? And then they sold it to the Bush administration as a blueprint for what should be the enhanced interrogation techniques, with I, which I think you disagree with, that were used at Guantanamo Bay. Well, I was uh, actually recruited by the Australians uh, in 2000. I joined the Australian Air Force in 2001. And uh, after 9-11, I worked at, at counterterrorism for the Australian military. And... Uh, Incidentally, I also helped them start up their own SEER program, and we uh, trained their special air service guys to go into action. But uh, something that really uh, you're asking a question about after 9-11, uh, could you rephrase that question just one more time for me? Sure. I, and there, I was reading something about after 9-11, you learned that two of the mm -hmm. SEER psychologists you'd work with had, had reverse engineered the program and sold it to the Bush administration as a blueprint for the enhanced, enhanced interrogation techniques employed at Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib and some of the other black sites around the world. When you learned about that, that they had also made $80 million through its use, you kind of went off. Uh, tell us what happened there. Break it down for us. So I was down in Australia, and uh, I read Jim Risen's book. And in Jim Risen's book, he said that there was a, the harsh interrogations were being done by SEER instructors, and he noted that they were Army SEER instructors. So around... 2009, I was thinking, all oh, those very stupid Army guys, they really got themselves caught up in something bad. And then uh, later I came to find out through an article written by Jeff K., Dr. Jeffrey K., uh, that actually connected the dots of uh, Bruce Jessen, Jim Mitchell, and Roger Aldridge. All three of them I worked together with uh, for about three years in Spokane, Washington. And... Uh, Everything that we taught, our, our whole core of our structural instructional system essentially shows that if someone tortures you, that you really are the winner. Hmm. I want to ask you about some more things here in a minute, but I want to bring Ronald in now, Ronald Solomon, who we've been keeping on witness protection here for a few minutes. Uh, Ronald... So uh, Mike blows the whistle on this to major newspapers and legislators and online sites and government agencies and anybody with an ear, but no one was really listening. And you weren't that interested the first time he came to you with this, but then he came and you decided to write a, a co-write a book. Tell us about how you got involved in this whole thing. Well, Michael found me. I was living quite peacefully. I'd left Hollywood and, and kind of retired to the mountains in Colorado. Uh, and Michael found me. He was in uh, Evergreen, this town we live in through a mutual friend, and he approached me uh, and told me the story, and, you know, quite frankly, I, I didn't believe it. Um, right. You know, not only, it just seemed so outlandish that our country was torturing people, and I know, obviously, this is before the revelations uh, about, you know, all the photographs from Abu Ghraib and, and everything that came out about Gitmo and the black ops sites. So I, I listened, and part of me just wouldn't let it go. Yeah. So uh, I started to do some research on my own, uh, and I found out that what Michael had said was, was true. And I was, I was really quite appalled by it. I couldn't shake it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there were a couple of things that play in my mind. The, the first of one was my personal safety. You know, I didn't really feel like writing a tell-all book um, about torture and about people who were torturing and busting people and, mm -hmm. you know, having my life and my family potentially impacted by it. And then the other part of it was there's a lot of nonfiction written about things like this, 
you know, the, right. the, the bad treatment of veterans. And, and it doesn't necessarily seem to make too much of an impact. So by creating a work of fiction, uh, political action thriller, you know, a Tom Clancy vein, sure. people tend to, when they read these books uh, or watch these television shows, they tend to, uh, they tend to internalize it, uh, and it becomes a, a much more an emotional thing for them. And so we felt that this would have the most impact, and indeed it really has. You know, uh, we're, we're talking about the book Broken here with uh, Michael Kearns and, and Ronald Solomon. Uh, Mike, I want to come back to you for a second. A, a guy that's used, I'm sure, a number of different kind of tech tactics. What works, what doesn't when you're when you're interrogating uh, people who might be terrorists or, or who are terrorists? What works, what does not work? Well, from my perspective, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the person Ali Soufan. Mm-hmm. Ali Soufan was the actual interrogator from the FBI that was interrogating Abu Zubaydah. Yes. And uh, his technique would be the technique uh, anyone who is smart about interrogation would use. It's called the friendly approach, and where you're actually learning about them, and you're discussing your life, and you're getting some empathy, potentially. You're giving them some warm things to drink, some more clothes, you know, it's, it's absolutely the opposite of what you would see on 24. When you, we want, yeah, we go want ahead. people that are going to want to join us to become part of America in some way. Well, first of all, you want to have uh, the army go out and pick the right people for you to interview, to interrogate. Uh, you know, you get lower level people, you can tell their rank, their statue, you know, and then you're cross checking with other files you might have. But you really want to target that very senior person that you really know they have information that uh, somehow you you want to get it out of them and. Courtesy costs you nothing, really, and that's our approach. A lot of it, obviously, I am no expert in this area, so you, you're the guys that you're the expert on this. And uh, uh, why does there were a lot of us that had some really rough feelings after 9/11 when we watched 3,000 fellow citizens go down, uh, and it was almost like you know, do whatever you want to to them because we really don't care. That was kind of the idea. Uh, and and you, I'm sure you heard that from a lot of people and maybe even felt it yourself. I don't know. That had to be tough going out and interrogating people during that time. But one of the things that you make a point of saying is that, that torturing the enemy really doesn't work. Why not? Because you create more terrorists. If you, Unless you kill the person, right? They're mm-hmm. your only option, Gary. You know, because uh, if someone gets tortured, right. they go home. Right, right now in Guantanamo, there's people that have been there, what, 13, 14 years? Right. There's going to be a point where they're going to either be moved to the U.S. in some uh, Navy brig or eventually be let go. Because as I understand it, about 25% of the people presently in uh, Guantanamo have never appeared before a judge. And uh, several of them have already had clearance to go for four, five, six years. It's just, it's government bureaucracy. Ronald, there's a, a kind of an interesting take on this that you say, okay, um, we shouldn't do, uh, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't interrogate him this way. It shouldn't be torture. And yet at the same time, you know, we want to be better than that as a country. But we also are in a time where we are met with a new kind of um, a new kind of uh, enemy, I guess. It doesn't wear a uniform necessarily. We'll do just about anything as we've seen in the past several years with ISIS and other groups before that. So so we're trying to find a balance point here, aren't we? And, and do you go for that at all in this particular book? No. Uh, our perspective in the book is that torture does not work, and mm-hmm. not only does it not not only does it not work on on getting actionable intelligence, reliable information, it, it actually is destructive to those who who do the torturing, to those mm-hmm. who do the enhanced interrogation. You know, part of the the book is, is really how it's affected the torturers right. and, and, and what happens when they come back, uh, you know, into the United States, you know, after it's gone. You know, it's interesting that we did this because we've known, really as a civilization, for so long that when it comes to getting the truth, torture does not work. Torquemada was the Grand Inquisitor during the Spanish Inquisition, right. you know, one of the most notoriously brutal periods of time. And Torquemada said that 
torture was a bad way to find the truth, but it was a great way for people to admit whatever you wanted them to say because a person will say anything to make the pain stop. Yeah. We're going to come back and talk more with Michael Kearns and Ronald Solomon about the book Broken. And uh, will be a book that you might just want to read out there. We'll be back with Michael and Ronald right after this. This is the Gary Sutton Show, and it's News Radio 910 WSBA. Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show. Michael Kearns and Ronald Solomon have teamed up to write a book. Uh, it's a fiction book, but it's called Broken, and uh, it regards um, enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, what works, what does not. Ronald, I was really intrigued. Uh, you had some personal experiences. Uh, you kind of immersed yourself in writing this whole thing, and, and you, you did some real hands-on kind of stuff, right? Oh, absolutely. Tell me some of the stuff you went through here in writing the book. Well, I didn't get tortured. Uh, didn't really, you know, I interviewed a lot of SEALs and Rangers and Marines and worked with Michael. Uh, I was threatened a number of times. <laughs> a number of times. Um, but I, I kind of drew the line. Um, and, and use my imagination on, on those particular things. But uh, as far as the other information is, is concerned in the book, I really did immerse myself. I, I tried to get into multiple uh, DOD installations, uh, de you know, defense contractors, uh, to get some information, and I got met by armed guards and dogs. In some cases, the police were called in. Uh, I got multiple calls from the FBI because of what I was doing. I... Mm -hmm. I flew in airplanes over top secret installations in the middle of the desert out in Barstow and Adelanto. Uh, Did I read that you skydived from one from a Cessna? <laughs> jumped out of a plane. Uh, I even I even went so far as to have my son, who thought I was insane, lock me in the trunk of his car, um, a small Subaru, and drive me around Denver because uh, I wanted to get the feeling of panic. Uh, uh, and the sensory deprivation, uh, and and uh, part of the story is teaching people what to do if they're abducted, you know, part of the survival. Uh, and I wanted to see if I could keep my wits and, and stay oriented. And, you know, to be honest, even knowing that I was in my kid's car and I could have banged on, on, on it at any time to stop him, uh, I still could not do it. You know, Michael, you were mentioning about the people who are the people applying enhanced interrogation techniques and how many of their lives have been changed. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and, and some of the examples that you've seen. I'm sorry, you broke up just for a second. I'm you sorry. The people we're describing? Yeah, it's the people that, that actually had to carry out enhanced interrogation techniques like yourself and, and the effect that it has on those people, because I can't imagine when you do that to people that it, it's not something that stays with you for an awful long time. Oh, indeed, for an instructor as well. Uh, now, of course, in my case, I was uh, in our program, the Special Survival Training Program at Fairchild Air Force Base. Uh, we trained all of the Tier 1 JSOC guys, so we're talking super, super athletes. You know, they're our right. assassination force overseas. And this, we also taught the National Security Agency guys that were out flying on airplanes around the world, you know, using their uh, many language skills. Uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, the course never had a person fail, our course. And our course went after they had already had their combat survival course. So we typically would get people that just came out of the woods. Uh, they have a POW camp that's also part of the combat survival school. Uh, I was duly qualified to teach in that as well. And, uh, and then those personnel that were either going to go work for JSOC or work for NSA would come to our building and we really never talked about what we did, but essentially we were the advanced trainers for resistance to interrogation. Uh, the brutality of what we did was more in the mind of the student than the true brutality, hmm. if that makes sense. So in other words, you because, put, yeah, I think I do understand what you're saying. Um, because, and if you, if you use just, I'm sure your listeners can uh, conjure up in their own minds that uh, the way our building was set up was quite unique. We had a theater chairs who were up to 15 people, and in front of that was a, a large screen for uh, cassettes from the back. And then that screen, when the screen comes up, you're looking into an interrogation booth. Hmm. And so uh, students in the class... Uh, Whenever we did a scenario, we would give a general scenario. We would say, okay, this, these are the kinds of 
things you need to say in this scenario. Is everyone prepared? Everyone shook their head yes. The lights go down. Uh, one of our big guys who plays the guard would come and snap somebody out of the room, and there they go. Uh, they're in the interrogation. They don't know what technique is going to be used, right. uh, what kind of person is going to be uh, fronting them when they walk in. One person, two people is going to be uh, – we didn't have a water board, like I said, but we used water. So, uh, you yeah, we could do simulated things, and it was just, I call it, uh, a big boy school for resistance. I guess the question that probably a lot of people are asking out there, Ron, is where's the fine line between you know getting information and brutalizing someone? Where is that? Where is that line? Where where do we not cross? And and because we've had you know we've had that debate now since really 9/11 and and getting people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and other people like that uh, to get information to us. The fine line is really in the Geneva Conventions, uh, and, and there are, there's all kinds of international treaties on, on, on how the treatment of, of human beings and, on, and of prisoners. Mm-hmm. You know, the FBI, they use something called the Reed Technique, and it has to do with relationship building right. and interrogation techniques, right. and they walked out of Gitmo. Uh, they would not participate in the CIA's programs uh, because they know that they do not work. So the question uh, really, it, to me, is not where do you draw the line? The question is what works. And if it doesn't work, it, if slapping someone in the face doesn't work, then then why do it? And and to push it further and further along, they were they were torturing mentally ill people uh, and, and expecting to get information. There were goat herders and taxi drivers that, that they were torturing um, I think that that's the wrong question. It's not where do you draw the line. The question is what works. And and so my question is then what works? Well, what works is relationship building. Mm-hmm. You know, and when you're when, when you, <laughs> Judge Anton Scalia, okay, mm-hmm. he utilized he used when talking about congressional jurisprudence, right, and the study of legal legalities of this. Right. He actually cited an episode of Twenty Four where Jack Bauer uh, was torturing someone. Right. So it, it's, so in, it's so entrenched in popular culture, right, anecdotally that this works, but the reality is that it simply does not. So it just needs to be taken off the table. You're not going to get someone to break their will. You're not going to get someone who's a religious zealot to admit something, to change his mind, um, when you're hurting him, yeah. uh, you're going to, you want to capture his heart, you want to capture his mind, you want to make a deal with him. You, you really have to go a different route. Uh, you know, as Michael said, torture creates more terrorists. Michael, uh, the name of the book is Broken. Where could people find the book? It's on Amazon. There you go. Everything's on Amazon anymore, right? You go to Amazon.com, you can find Broken. But it sounds like a great book. Uh, I really appreciate both you guys being with us this morning. And, and you know, we try to get to the bottom of these kind of situations uh, and give people a lot to think about on all sides. So I appreciate your perspective on it today. And thank you for all the hard work that you did in this. And, uh, Ronald, thank you so much for getting involved and helping to make sure that book came to be a reality. Well, thank you. Thanks both to both of you, thank and you. have a great day. Take you care. You too. Bye-bye. Michael Kearns and uh, Ronald Solomon with us here on the Gary Sutton Show this morning as uh, talking about a different look at uh, enhanced interrogation techniques, what really works, what really doesn't. Uh, we'll let that up to you. But read the book, Broken. It. It's, a, it's a fiction book, but it's based around real events, okay? And if you're like me, you love that kind of book, okay?